Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. The title of the message today is The Prison Doors Swung Open, and we're going to be taking a look at Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 40. But before we do, I think I'll open up in a word of prayer. And God, I thank you that we can be here today. Lord, today there may be people out here that just feel like they're, they're in a situation in life they can't get out of. And I pray that this message today would speak to them in a very intimate and personable way. And Lord, that through all of this that you would be glorified. Pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to be upon every aspect of this service today. I ask that you would open our ears and open our eyes to the things of yours, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I've been setting the, the tone here for our upcoming study in First and Second Thessalonians, and we've been going through Acts chapter 16 the last couple of weeks that I've, I've taught. And the last time that I was up here, I, I, I shared a story in which the Apostle Paul was in Asia Minor. The Holy Spirit kept blocking direction from him. And then one night, he had a vision. He had a dream from a man in Macedonia that was saying, come, we need you over here. And I shared with you what made that so significant is up until that time, the gospel message had been being shared, but it being shared in Asia or in Asia Minor. When Paul and his associates crossed over the waterway there in the Aegean Sea and they came over to Philippi, this is the first church, the first, first base that they had in the continent of Europe. Well, we saw that when they got there, Paul's normal practice is he, he looks for a synagogue, he goes to the synagogue, and he begins to reason with them from the Old Testament scripture about Jesus and that Jesus is the Christ, but there was no synagogue. And so on that Sabbath day, on that Saturday, when Christians uh, would, would uh, go to, to worship at that time. You had the Jews who were worshiping on Saturday. Paul would always go to the synagogue and he would begin to reason, but because he couldn't, he ended up going outside and he found a, a group of ladies about a mile and a half west of town. It was there that he came across a lady by the name of Lydia. And he ended up leading Lydia and the ladies that were with her, the members of her household of faith. He ended up baptizing them. And we had the very first church in the continent of Europe established there. Well, if you haven't figured it out already, any time in your life that you're going to begin uh, a spiritual adventure, any time in your life that you're going to begin to grow in the faith, you're going to find that the enemy is going to attack you immediately. He's going to knock you down. He's going to try his best to discourage you so that you don't want to continue on in your walk with the Lord. And immediately we see that that begins to happen to Paul and Silas to interfere with the ministry. But today we're going to look at, at the story of the Philippian jailer. We're going to see the remarkable story around his conversion, and we're going to see how that conversion is really a picture of our conversion today to Christ. So if you open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, we're going to begin with verse 16 here. And Luke writes, he says, now it happened as we went to pray. So once again, the, the first time they went to pray, they, they went out and they found Lydia and, and the ladies out there. Now we're on another Sabbath. Now Paul's heading out there with his associates once again. And it says, now as, we, as it happened, we went out to pray that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Now, the spirit of divination, it can also mean the spirit of python. And that spirit of divination was the ability to be able to tell the future. And that concept of the spirit of Python comes from the word Pythia, Pythia who was the, the priestess of the oracle of Delphi, or Delphi, excuse me. And uh, so she, she's out there, and apparently this, this gift has been given to her to be able to, to tell the, the, the future. Now, it's interesting that 
the spirit of division is likened to that of a python. I've got a picture of a python up on, on the screen here. It doesn't look too scary as we look at it until you realize that pythons can grow to, to nearly 20 feet. I found out they've actually been caught at 23 feet. They're huge. They've got the girth of a telephone pole. They're massive. There's pictures of them on YouTube of them eating wallabies. Wallabies are small versions of the kangaroo. There's pictures up there of them eating full crocodiles and full alligators. And there's even pictures on the internet of them trying to eat a tiger. These things are absolutely huge. Now you might be saying, yeah, right, a tiger? Really? Well, I saw the video that they had on here and they didn't bring it all the way to the conclusion, but as the video ended that the python had the tiger wrapped all the way in a death grip and it didn't look like that tiger was going to be able to get out of there. And so uh, these things are huge. These things are vicious. In fact, I got a picture here of a, a large python that's just finishing swallowing an, an entire alligator whole. And, and this is the imagery that this young girl had. This young girl was, was possessed by a demon. That demon was the one who would speak through her. Through her being possessed by the demon, the owners were able to make a lot of money, and Paul and Silas are about to get them really upset. You know, I think the, the serpent is a fitting picture of Satan because he goes after individuals, especially those of us, and he tries to devour us. And that's a good picture of what Satan actually does to, to people. Well, the python was a mythological or mythical spirit killed by Apollo, in the ancient Apollo, the god who supposedly took to both took both the, the serpent's gifts of predictions and sometimes its likeness and form. The Greek mythology, the in Greek mythology, the python was a snake that guarded the oracle of Delphi. And that oracle of Delphi was uh, one of the most well-known shrines in all of Greece. Well, the owners were becoming very wealthy. And why were they becoming very wealthy? Well, this, this young girl could come out and by demon possession, she was able to tell people the future. And then, even as today, people are willing to, to pay for that. We see people today that will go to fortune tellers and they will pay them so that they will tell them what the future will hold for them. And so these guys were really happy with that. They were making a lot of money. They didn't care about the young girl that she was possessed by a demon and that they were keeping her as a slave. What they cared about is their money. The NIV Study Bible notes bring out an important point. It says, the spirit by which she predicted the future was a demonic python spirit. The python was a mythical snake worshipped at Delphi and associated with the Delphic code, the Delphic oracle. The term python came to be used of the persons through whom the python spirit supposedly spoke. Since such persons spoke involuntarily, the term ventri ventriloquist was used to describe them. To what extent she actually predicted the future is not known. So today we'll watch television and we'll see individuals get on there and they've got this skill of a ventriloquist. They'll get a little puppet, they'll start playing with that puppet, talking with their, their hand, and they cast their voice. So the voice comes from somewhere else and that's where that whole concept of a ventriloquist came from, is this demon spirit being able to speak through this girl or to be able to speak out through other individuals who were demonically possessed. But However much he did the, the sharing, the people were willing to pay for that. Verses 17 through 18. This girl followed Paul, and notice the word here, in us. What does that mean? Do you remember I told you last time that we met that we were into the we passages of the book of Acts? You've got Paul, you've got Silas, you've got Timothy. They've been that team. However, a fourth person ended up joining them, and that was Luke, the writer of the book of Acts. And so as he's writing here, he's saying us. So as he's sharing, he's not only writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he's sharing firsthand that which he experienced. This girl followed Paul and us, and she cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did that for many days. Day after day, she did. These men are the servants of the Most High God. These are the servants of El El Yon in the Hebrew, of the Most High God. And you stop and you think, well, yeah, they are. And they did come to share the way of salvation. So what's the big deal? You know, why, why would that even begin to bother Paul? The girl was crying out the truth. 
But here's the thing. Have you ever heard people say things in different ways? You can have somebody that comes out and tells the truth, but they don't believe the truth. And they say it in a very mocking tone. And it may be that that girl is there going out every day that she was following along and the things that she was saying were in a very mocking tone and that was beginning to bother Paul. It may be that fortune telling, which is what she did, was forbidden by God in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 10. And Paul knew that and he was upset that every day that she was going out, that she was doing that, she was violating the law of God. Or it may have been that maybe there was something even more significant that led to the anger of Paul. And perhaps what that would be, these men are servants of the Most High God. And they've come to share the way of salvation. Well, for the Jew, the Jew would right away think the Most High God is El El Yon. And wouldn't have a problem with that whatsoever. But these individuals here weren't Jews. These individuals here were Greeks. Greeks were polytheistic. They believed in many gods. In fact, the most high god for the Greeks was Zeus. And it may be that she was making references to Zeus here. And every day as they went out to preach about the one true God that they were following out and they were making these references about Zeus to the point where the Apostle Paul says, stop, I've had enough. I don't want any more. Jesus said in, um, lost it here, Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, he said this. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The world would have us think that the door to salvation is a wide door. But Christianity is very exclusive. It, the Bible tells us that there's only one way to salvation, that that one way is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. However, these people had come to think that this young girl who was demon-possessed, who would come out with these fortune-telling predictions, was the truth, that she would reveal the truth. But Jesus was, and Paul had had enough. Verses 18 and 19. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and he said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope for profit was gone, they ended up getting really, really angry. You know, this young girl, I mean, we, we hear so much today about uh, the slave trade that's going on, even in our country, and I can't imagine that it's happening, but here it's all over the place. This young girl was a slave. She was there for a profit. She was a money-making machine for her masters, and they appreciated that. And now Paul had had enough, and in the name of Jesus Christ, he commanded that demon to leave, and instantly that demon left. They realized that now their means of having a profit was gone. They weren't going to be able to make a profit under her anymore. And now, the one who brought them so much money now had become a liability to them, and they were really upset about this whole issue and, and, and angry at Paul and Silas. Verse 19b continues, and it says, And they seized Paul, and they seized Silas, and they dragged them, they dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. You notice only the Jews, Paul and Silas, end up getting arrested. There was four of them. They had Paul, they had Silas, they had Timothy, they, they had Luke. Timothy was a half-Jew, but he was a half-Greek. Luke was a full Greek. Only Paul and Silas were Jews. And it says, they seized Paul and Silas. They dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says this. It says, shortly before the incident, the Emperor Claudius had expelled the Jews from Rome. Uh, that's in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. Philippi, a Roman colony, would have caught this flavor of anti-Semitism. This also helps explain why Timothy and Luke were not taken before the authorities. And so it may be that there was something here where because they were Jews, because of what they were doing, they were the ones who were the target. Verses 20 and 21. And they brought them to the magistrates. And they said, these men, here you go, these men, being Jews, there it is, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or to observe. 
Well, we see that title magistrates, but we try to wonder what, what in the world is going on. This was a Roman colony. Now, Roman colonies, each Roman colony would have two magistrates. A magistrate was a civil official who was responsible for the governing of that community, and they also acted in the function of being a judge. And so in this particular case, they end up bringing Paul, they bring up Silas to, to the magistrates because they're the ones who are going to be able to dish out the punishment as well. Well, the charge was that Paul and Silas were promoting an illegal religion. Uh, another charge that they had for him is that they were causing insurrection. It's interesting that when we look back on Jesus and some of the charges, the false charges that they came, uh, brought up against him is uh, the, uh, that, that he was, in a sense, causing insurrection and, and uh, all the stuff that was being false, or the false teachings as false accusations. But there was an element of truth in the sense that Judaism was a, an approved religion of the Roman Empire. The Jews would say, no, these Christians, they're, they're, they're not right. These Christians are, are, are a cult. These Christians are off to the side. I have a friend to clarify this. Um, but when I was, before I came into ministry, I was back in Hayward, California, and I had a Bible study in my home. And I had, had an old messianic Jewish friend by the name of Bill Gamberg. Bill was incredible. This guy, um, he had had a stroke, and he'd always say, I can't remember, I can't remember. But I'd be teaching Bible study, and I'd say something, and all of a sudden, it would trigger Bill, and his mind would come alive, and he would come up with something that's so profound that I had never heard before. So what I would do as the teacher is when Bill started to talk, I'd just shut up, and I'd let him know, because I knew the Lord was working on him at that point. And he was so cool to have in that Bible study and get the Jewish perspective on the different aspects of, of Christianity and of Scripture. Well, we had a new person come into Bible study one day, and I wanted to introduce him to my friend Bill, and I was so proud of him, and I took him over, and I, I introduced him, and I said, you know, I'd like you to meet my friend Bill Gamberg. He's a converted Jew. <laughs> Ooh, I made a mistake. I, I never say that again. Bill about came out of his seat, and he said, converted Jew? You're a converted Gentile. He said, I'm a fulfilled Jew. You catch that? I'm a fulfilled Jew. I have found my Messiah. And so for the Jews, they saw Christianity as this offshoot that was way off track. But in reality, Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism in the sense that Jesus Christ is our Lord, that Jesus Christ is the Jewish Messiah, that the church is made up of both Jews and Gentiles alike. And so they, they, they had this negative view upon the church and they had a negative view upon the Gentiles. It wasn't until 312 AD when Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire that the persecution ended up stopping. Well, the magistrate should have investigated this matter thoroughly, but they didn't. And maybe part of that was the mob mentality that was going around as everybody was so angry. Isn't it interesting today, we hear a lot about Israel and uh, how they've taken the territory that's, that's not theirs, even though we see in the Bible that God has given them that territory. And, and yet, we take a look at the land here on this map and see just how much, how many countries, how much land, how, how many countries have been taken over by the Muslims. And if you look in that box, that little red strip of land, you'll see the land of Israel. And that land of Israel has the, the West Bank in it. That land of Israel has Gaza in it. That land of Israel has the Golan Heights in it. I uh, had the opportunity to go there. If you go from north to south, the entire length of the land is about 300 miles. But if you look at the populated area of the land of Israel, you'll find out that it's an area about the size of the San Francisco Bay Area. So imagine in that mass of countries that are controlled by Muslims, having a country in there that you have to share that's about the size of the San Francisco Bay Area. Now I've seen banks, or banks, I've seen, seen maps of the West Bank and, and where the, the, the lines are supposed to be for each side, they want the two-state solution there. But there's areas in there that if, if, if Israel does what the UN is telling them to do, they'll have their country 12 miles wide. Think about that. That's not even from here to Lakeside. That's indefensible. You can't defend in that kind of a situation. And as we look around the world today, the Jewish people are the most hated people group in the entire world. 
But have you noticed how things are changing even with Christianity in the world? We, we see today that uh, uh, this country began with the background uh, of individuals who, who love the Lord and set this country up on the principles of God's word, at least as best as they could. And yet now we're seeing things change in our own country and around the world where in the last couple of years, Christians have been the most persecuted people group in the entire world. Things are rapidly changing, aren't they? Well, Jesus did not promise us health. He didn't promise us wealth if we follow him. What he promised us was hatred and persecution. In John chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus said, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Don't be surprised if you're walking for Christ if people begin to persecute you. If they persecuted Jesus, they will also persecute you. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, Jesus said, You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. We can, we can take it to the bank that if we're walking with Christ, there's going to be people that hate us. And they're going to hate us not so much because of us, but for whose name's sake that we're standing, because we're standing for the name of Jesus. But Jesus says, hey, but he who endures to the end will be saved. We want to continue on even if, even if those attacks end up coming to us. But I'll tell you what, going through difficult times, being attacked for our faith is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, if we look at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, Jesus said, Blessed are you when they revile you. Or in other words, when they, they, they speak violently, they speak horrible things about you. They, they, they talk you down. Blessed are you when they revile you and they persecute you and they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. <laughs> That's kind of an odd statement, and I'll tell you what, when you're going through difficult times, you, you don't really feel blessed because you're being persecuted, do you? And yet we know that if we're being persecuted for Christ, we'll be blessed. If we're being persecuted for the wrong things in which we do, then we need to go through the consequences for the actions in which we've done. But here we see that sometimes we don't feel so blessed when we're being persecuted. Verse 22 says, Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes, and they commanded them to be beaten with rods. When we see the multitude, what that's talking about is not just a group of people. What it's talking about is a mob. And when you get a mob mentality, nobody knows exactly what's going to end up happening from, from that mindset because people will do things that they normally aren't willing to do. And the magistrates ordered that their clothes would be torn off. Why would the clothes be torn off of their back? Because maybe the shirt would protect some of the blows so that it wouldn't be as severe, as, as painful, as if it was bare flesh that was taking the beating here. And you've got to think, you know, Paul gets this vision from this man in Macedonia, receives this confirmation from the Lord to go into Europe, to begin to take the gospel there. And you've got to wonder what was going on in his mind at that point. What a welcome he and Silas were receiving into this new area of ministry. Well, the magistrates ordered that their clothes be torn off. This would make the beating even more painful. Now, each lictor carried a bundle of rods and an axe. And the way they were prepared, that way I should say, they were prepared to issue whatever kind of punishment that the magistrates ordered. So you've got them coming around. They've got the, the bundle of rods and then they've got an axe on there. Well, sometimes you've got corporal punishment in which you, you get whooped. Another time you've got capital punishment in which you're killed. So whatever punishment was given out, those lictors were there prepared to give that punishment to the individuals who supposedly had violated whatever law it was. Now, how many of you, when you're talking to somebody who's gotten in a lot of trouble, maybe you're talking to the kids and you say, you keep that up, you're going to get a licking. Or you see somebody goes out and gets fought and they fight somebody and they end up losing and say, man, he sure got a licking, right? Where does that saying come from? Anybody know? It comes from the lictors. Because the lictors would go out and they would give a licking to the individuals that the magistrates told them to do. Well, Paul and Silas received a licking, and in this case, it wasn't for doing wrong. They received a licking for, a, a licking for their faithfulness to Jesus Christ. 
Paul would later remember the beating that he ended up having. In fact, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 through 25, it says this, it says, Are they Hebrews? So am I, Paul says. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? And then Paul says, I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths more often. Now here we go. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. And he wrote that even before the end of Acts where he ended up being shipwrecked on his way to Rome. And we see that as he's writing, he remembers. He remembers the beatings that he had. He remembers this incident that we're talking about today in which he had a beating, and he ended up recording that. I wonder how much we suffer for the name of Christ. You know, Paul suffered horribly. He, he was out there doing what he needed to do in the name of Jesus, and yet today I wonder how, how much we suffer. I see things happening in our country as, as we change. And I think the day is coming when standing for Christ, we're going to be seen as the enemy rather than the friend. I think standing for Christ, we're going to have to pay financially. We're going to have to pay with houses. I think we're going to have to pay with suffering. There's a, a change in the tide within our country. And I think you can see that right in on the wall. And the question is, are we willing to make the sacrifice like Paul and Silas and the apostles made in the early church? Verse 23. And when they had laid them many stri when they had laid many stripes on them, in other words, they beat them and they beat them good. When they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. I've got to wonder if, if they come in and, and they're beating them, keep in mind that both Paul and Silas are Roman citizens. Now, Roman citizens have the right to a trial. You cannot beat a Roman citizen apart from a trial. You cannot throw them in jail in that sense like they did apart from a trial. And yet they weren't given the rights in which a Roman citizen deserves. So why weren't Paul and Silas saying, hey, we are Roman citizens. You can't beat us. We have the right to a trial. Have you ever seen mob mentality? Yelling and screaming and people everywhere. And, and, and things happening really quick. And I have to wonder if maybe they did tell him. I don't know for sure. Maybe they did tell him. Some people say, look, they just, they just held back on that news for later down, down the road when it was more critical to let people know that they were Roman citizens. But why in the world would they go through a beating like that? I have to believe that they tried to share that, but the people wouldn't listen. And they just went ahead and they did it anyways because of all the shouting and confusion and everything else that was around. Well, verse 24 continues and it says, having received such a charge, insurrection, promoting an unauthorized religion. The jailer, he put them into the inner prison, fastened their feet in stocks. He takes Paul and he takes Silas, even though they hadn't done anything. And because of the mob mentality, because of the judgment of the magistrates, they're seen as serious enough threats that they take them into the inner cell of the prison, the most secure section. And they put their feet in stocks. And they put their hands in chains. They end up taking Paul and, and Silas and they, they treat them like the worst of criminals. Now you might say, well, what's the big deal about stocks? You know, stocks are, you've got wood on the bottom, you've got wood on the top. But you notice when you're in stocks, what they would do is they would tend to spread your legs. And over time, sitting down in that position, what would happen is you would go into very severe leg cramps. Now, when I get a leg cramp at night, I never knew I could get out of bed that quick. And maybe that way as well. When that leg cramp comes on, it really hurts. And it hurts bad. And so they purposely did this to them so that as part of their punishment, that they would also be having severe leg cramps as they're sitting back there. The Life Application Bible puts it this way. It says, Stocks were made of two boards joined with iron clamps, leaving holes just big enough for the ankles. The prisoner's legs were placed across the lower board, and then the upper board was closed over them. Sometimes both wrists and ankles were placed in stocks. If you go on the internet and you look at pictures, you can see some prisoners that are that way. It looks incredibly painful and painful on the back as well. 
So Paul and Silas, who had committed no crime and who were peaceful men, were put in stocks, presented for holding the most dangerous of prisoners. Now, if I was in their shoes, I'd be thinking, I hadn't done anything. And I think I'd be a little bit agitated that without a trial, they'd done that, they'd put me in here, and I'm going through these leg cramps. This is a horrible thing to happen. But that's not how Paul and Silas ended up happen, uh, reacting. If you look at verse 25, it says, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, and they were singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, how did Paul and Silas respond as the majority of the city slept that night? They're in there. They're, they're in the jail. They've got other prisoners around them. And they could have been crying. They could have been griping about the injustice that was done to them. But when it came about midnight, what were they doing? They were praying. And they were praising. And they were singing hymns to God. Why is that important? Because I'll tell you what. When you're singing hymns to God, God does incredible things. We go through hard times and the temptation is to get angry at God, isn't it? Where in fact what you see happening here is these guys go through hard times and they're praising God because they had the right to suffer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're there praising and we're going to see the effect of that prayer and praise in, in just a minute. The other night I was watching the news on television and I've got to tell you, I, was, I, I just about came out of my chair. I, 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 ooh, I, was, I was outraged. I'm sitting there watching the news. Beto O'Rourke's on there. He's all upset because of the um, shooting that went on. He was upset because of President Trump. And in order to express the anger in which he had, he got on national TV and he used the name of Jesus Christ as a cuss word. I don't know if that bothers you. That bothers the heck out of me. Amen. This is my Lord. This is my Savior. I don't care what political party they're in. That's my Lord. He died for my sins. That name's not to be kicked around. And if we use the name Jesus Christ in such a way that you could replace, you name it, any swear word and plug it in there and say the same thing, we've used the name of the Lord in vain. Well, Paul and Silas could have very easily done that. But they didn't. In fact, they used that opportunity to pray to God and to praise Him and to thank Him for the difficult times in which they were going through because God has promised that He'll never leave us, He'll never forsake us, that in all things God works for the good of those who are called according to His purpose. He's always at work. Well, instead of speaking blasphemy against God, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns to God that night. I'm not sure how many of you have gone through difficult times in your life and, and you've found that there's great comfort in Christian music. There's great comfort in, in singing songs of praise. Why would that be? Because it helps us to focus upon the Lord. And not only does it help us to focus upon the Lord, but it gets our mind on good things, on edifying things. It builds us up rather than tears us down. That's one of the things I love about Sunday morning. We're sitting here today. This was an incredibly beautiful worship time that we had today. We're gathering here as we're singing these words. Some people walk into church, and if they're not used to being at church, one of the things they'll say is, I don't like the music part. You can get rid of the music part and just bring on the teaching or whatever it might be, and, 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 and I'm good with that. But do you realize how precious it is to sing some of these songs that we're singing with the words? You won't remember what I'm saying, but you will remember what the words of the song end up saying. And I just absolutely love what Charles Wesley, he's the brother of John Wesley, but he's a hymn writer who wrote tons of hymns in the 1700s. And he said, he who sings prays twice. And the next time we, we're, we're singing here in worship, you stop and think about that. Not only are you speaking the words, but you're praying. You're praying in a new and a fresh way. Well, are you able to praise the Lord during the difficult times in your life? It's important for us to remember that light shines the brightest when things are the dark, darkest. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, the Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, Do all things without complaining or disputing. That's exactly what they're doing here. Do all things without complaining or disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. 
And Paul's saying, look, don't complain. Don't be griping. Realize that when the darkness is at its darkest point, that the light shines brighter. Take that little match today and you'd see the match. But if this was pitch black in here and I lit that match, you'd see it nice and bright. And so we as Christians are to shine as lights in a world holding fast to the word of God in which we believe. You see, prayer and praise can be incredibly powerful. And God responded in this particular case with an earthquake. In verse 26 it says, Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open. Everyone's chains were loosed. And so there's three supernatural events that end up taking place that night. Number one, the earthquake was supernaturally originated by God. It became a real attention getter. Number two, the doors of the prison were supernaturally opened by God. And then number three, we see that the chains that were on the prisoners were supernaturally unlocked by God. And as we look at this event, we see that this was what I like to call a God thing. It was something that they didn't do. It was something that God did. And he did it for his glory. Verse 25. Now watch, watch what happens here. He said, at midnight, Paul and Silas were singing and, and, and praying. They, they, they were singing hymns and they were praying to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. I don't know how many commentaries I read as I was preparing for today. I said the whole time that they're in there and as Paul and Silas are talking and they're singing and they're praying that the jailer is there and they're preparing his heart for this. But do you see what the Word of God says there? Who was listening? It was the prisoners who were in jail with Paul and Silas. They were the ones who were listening. You see, the Philippian jailer was sound asleep. Uh, he, like so many of the lost today, didn't realize that he was the one who was truly in bondage. And sometimes it takes earth-shaking events within our lives to wake us up. It may take a death of a loved one. It may take uh, a, a serious illness that we have. It may take a, a loss of a job or a crisis in our life in order to wake us up and bring us back to Christ in the way in which we, we should be. But the jailer, it says, was awakened. Look at verse 27. It said, And the jailer of the prison awakened from sleep, and seeing that the prison doors were open, supposing that the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword, and he was about to kill himself. During all of this time, until the earthquake ended up coming, what was the jailer doing? He was asleep. And all of a sudden, he gets awake, and, and, and he's startled. And he realizes that he is in really big trouble. You see, because back in those days, when a jailer was put in charge of a prison, if something happened to the prisoners, that was his life. And so he realized that not only would he lose his job, he'd probably end up losing his life because of this. Didn't matter it was supernatural. Didn't matter that it was from an earthquake. And so what was his solution? The solution that he chose was to commit suicide. We heard... Uh, just yesterday, the suicide of a financer, a billionaire financer, and uh, it's questionable, that whole thing, who had apparently um, molested a lot of underage girls, got into the sex slave stuff, and there's about 12 victims. I was listening to it on the news, and one of the things, they, they were so angry, and they said, justice will never be served. You know, we'll never have closure to this. Uh, he, he's, he's gotten away scot-free is basically what they ended up saying. And I'm sitting there, boy, have you ever got that wrong? Because if this guy did the things that they're claiming that he did, committing suicide didn't make it better. Committing suicide made it worse, and it took away the only chance that he had to repent because now he's got to face the wrath of God. And I'll tell you what, I'd rather face the wrath of man any day than the wrath of God. This guy did not get away scot-free. But the Philippian jailer is thinking, oh man, I, 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 this is bad for me. I'm, I'm thinking about committing suicide. And notice what Paul does as soon as he realizes, verse 28, but Paul called in a loud voice and he said, do yourself no harm. For we're all here. You see what he does? Son? As soon as he realizes this man has this thought in his mind, he says, whoa, 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 stop. But the thing that was amazing to me is in the Bible, we can see it in Acts chapter 5, we can see it in Acts chapter 12. When, when jail doors are supernaturally opened by angels or somehow God supernaturally, naturally, supernaturally opens the door, what happens to the individuals who are behind? 
We see Peter, we see the apostles. As soon as that door is open, guess what happens? They're gone. They're out. But in this particular case, the earthquake comes, the doors open, the chains fall, but they stay. And not only just Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas, and all of the prisoners who are there, they end up staying rather than running. Instead of running, they saw the opportunity here to minister, and God gave them a ministry that was going to count for all eternity. Verse 29, so he called for a light. In other words, the jailer. He called for a light. He ran in. He didn't know what he was calling for. Did he call for a light? He was about ready to get a light. He was about getting ready to get a light from the Lord on here. He called for a light, and he ended up running in, and he fell down, and he trembled before Paul and Silas. You see, this whole time, the jailer thought he was in charge. The jailer didn't realize that he was the real prisoner, not Paul and Silas. He was the one who needed to be released from the bondage of sin and death. Verse 30. And he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, we've got to ask the question, what did he mean by that? There's two ways that we can interpret the jailer's questions to Paul, or question to Paul. Number one, was he asking how he could be saved from the wrath of the Roman authorities after the impending prisoner escape? Everybody's loose. They're getting ready to go. And he comes in and he falls on his face before him and he says, Sir, how must I be saved? Maybe he's talking about saved from the Roman authorities as they come with their wrath to torture him and to slowly kill him. Or secondly, perhaps it's this. Was he asking how he could be saved from the future wrath of God? <laughs> I looked at these and a lot, the majority of people say, well, he was asking Paul, you know, how, how are you saved from the future wrath of God? I want you to think this through. I mean, as all of this stuff's happening, if, have you ever been in an earthquake before? It is freaky. And it's got a way of shaking you up more, in more than one way. It will rattle you. You can hear the earthquake coming before it ever hits. And by the time you're done, you, you are rattled. And then add to that, this guy was asleep. He, he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. He was asleep. And all of a sudden, he's awake. The doors are open. Everybody's unloosed. I don't think he had his eyes on eternal salvation way down the road. I think he realized he was in big trouble with the Roman authorities if they walked out and they were going to torture him and they were going to kill him and he was scared to death and he ended up going to the Apostle Paul pleading him, what, what can I do? I think hoping that Paul would save for the prisoners to stay in there. Well, Paul takes advantage of the jailer's question to, to share with him the, the, the real way to salvation. In verse 31, he says, so, so they said, Paul and, Sinobus, excuse me, Paul and Silas, notice, notice they on there, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Why is it that so often that we've got to go through a crisis in our life before we get shaken up enough where we realize we need God? Before we realize, especially if we're Christians and we've walked away, we need to get back and we need to get right with God. This week I was reading Table Talk magazine during my devotions and I was absolutely shocked by a quote that I saw. Uh, it was from a survey that Ligonier Ministries put out in 2016. And this is what one of the responses was from those who were surveyed. It said, 78% agreed with this statement. An individual must contribute to his or her own effort for salvation. Did you catch that? 78% of the people who were surveyed believe that an individual must contribute effort. They must do something to help with their salvation in order for them to be saved. That startles me. That means 22% would say that they don't. Because when I look at the biblical gospel, we don't have to do anything. We're saved by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. He did it. 78%. An individual must contribute his or her salvation, uh, his or her effort for personal salvation. It's interesting as I look at Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 12, it says this, as it is written, there are how many righteous? None. No, not one. There is how many? 
None who understands. There is how many? None who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is how many? None who does good. No, not one. Well, that's talking about unregenerate man. That's talking about before you come to faith. God doesn't see those works as good. We need to be born again. We need to have faith in Jesus Christ and the right motivation when we go out and we minister. Salvation is a free gift from God. It can't be bought. It can't be earned by doing good things. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. But only after we come to that point of salvation, only after we were regenerated, we see where the works come in. We go to the very next verse, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. The world says that's not right. All the religions are the same. You can be saved by all of these different ways of, of salvation. And Jesus said, no, you can't. In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate. The world's got a gate wide open. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. Works, maybe. But small is the gate. And narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. What's the last word? Alone. Alone. The other question in this is, is household salvation a guarantee for Christian families? Because you go to church, because you're a Christian, because you raise your family in church, does that mean that all of your children are guaranteed to be saved? And I have to say no. But if you're walking with the Lord, you will have a strong Christian influence upon their lives that you can present the gospel. You can present what the love of Christ is. Verse 31, they, meaning Paul and Silas, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. So is that a promise for you and for me, for all of us? And I think we find clarification here in verse 32. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. That evening, as Paul and Silas were with the Philippian jailer and those who were with them and those who were in the house, they shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Those who were there, those who heard, responded, they believed in the gospel, and they were saved. Verse 32, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all in their house. Warren Wiersbe says the, the phrase, in thy house, does not mean that the faith of the jailer would automatically bring salvation to his family. Each sinner must trust Christ personally in order to be born again, for we cannot be saved by proxy. Another way of putting that in the vernacular today is a child cannot be saved on the coattails of their parents. The parents may be able to make a huge impact upon them spiritually, but the child can't be saved on the coattails. That faith has got to become their own at some point in time. Verse 33, and he took them that same hour of the night, which was about midnight, and he washed their stripes, or he washed their wounds, and immediately he and all of his family were baptized. Do you notice the change in the, the jailer after he comes to Christ? He was sloppy. I mean, he was sleeping on the job. He was the one who was carrying out the punishment on these individuals. And all of a sudden, the punisher becomes the servant, and he begins cleaning the wounds of Paul and Silas. That tells us a little story right there, and that means that after that horrible beating that they received and they threw him in jail, they didn't even clean the wounds. They just put him in there. Paul and Silas were, were really hurting from those wounds, and now the jailer has changed, and he ends up cleaning the wounds. Church Father Christostom says this. He sa says, he washed and was washed. He washed them from their stripes, and he himself washed from his. He, he, he was himself washed from his own sins. 
Verse 33, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. That's the principle that we should have today. Yeah, we see people in the Bible, they come to faith and immediately they follow in baptism. Jesus said, therefore, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. In Acts chapter 2, Peter comes along and he says, repent every one of you in the name of Jesus and be in the name of the Lord Jesus and be baptized. We see in 1 Peter chapter 3 that baptism is the right thing to do. It's, it's the thing of a good conscience that we should do. We believe and we're baptized. But here's part of the problem here is the verse that we just looked at is often looked at as a proof text for pedo or infant baptism. And they say, no, wait a minute, how, how can that be? Well, because people say, well, it was the Philippian jailer and it was enti his entire household. And the Bible never says that he didn't have any infants in the house. So you can assume that perhaps he did have an infant in the house. And the whole argument here is an argument of silence. Because it's not mentioned, well, maybe it is. And so thus we do. And I don't know that that's the case. And here we see that it was totally different. In fact, you would think that from the argument that's, that's given, uh, it seems to indicate the opposite, that they heard and that they believed. But I want to ask you today, have you followed the Lord in water baptism? Because it's something that's really important. If you've come to Christ in your faith, it's critical that you go ahead and you follow him in baptism. That's the next step after you come to Christ. Verse 34, now... When he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. The change of behavior is, is very noticeable here. The individual who was bringing forth the punishment now is a brother in Christ. And he takes these individuals, he takes them into his home, he cleans their wounds, and then he feeds them. And he does all of this. They have that evening together before he takes them, and he puts them back in jail the following day. Well, after having mended their wounds and, and, and fed them, Paul and Silas returned to jail before, John, before dawn. Verse 35, and when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let those men go. I've got to ask, what changed their mind? They were being so brutal to them, and now daylight comes, and now they, they send uh, their officers in to talk to the jailer, probably the Philippian jailer who was with them the night before. He says, you let these guys go. What changed their mind? Well, I think maybe the earthquake might have had something to do that. You know, earthquakes has, has got a way of shaking you up. And maybe with that change, they decide, we need to let these guys go. This is not a good thing. Or the other possibility is, is maybe the sentence that they had given to them was up. And they said, to go ahead, and you guys go. You, you leave here. But watch what happens here. Verse 36. So the keeper of the prison, who was the Philippian jailer, now their brother, reported these things to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart. Therefore, you go in peace. And Paul sees right through it. If I leave here, they're taking the broom and they are just brushing the dirt under the carpet. That's exactly what they're doing. We were punished unjustly. We are not going to walk out. There is more at stake than what's on the surface. And Paul said, no. Verse 37, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and they have thrown us into prison. And now, did they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. <laughs> well, they had reason to, to be concerned. Uh, if, if they had done them unjustly, and Roman citizens were exempt from scourging, they're exempt from tor tor torture, they had the right to due process legally in a trial before being punished. None of that stuff was done for them. And if they just walked out, it would look like none of this was resolved, and the Christians who were in town there would still look like they were, were criminals. But what happened here is when Paul said, no, we're uncondemned Romans, the fear of the Lord went through them. Why? Because they had violated Roman law. Now, not only was their job at stake, but their lives are at stake. For the Roman colony, with all of those benefits, for those people with no taxation or anything like that, now not only was the job of the magistrates at risk, now the entire Roman colony was at risk. And they were terrified. 
says verse 38, and the officers were told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. John MacArthur says to inflict corporal punishment on a Roman citizen was a serious crime, and made more so, uh, <clears throat> and, and made more so since Paul and Silas did not receive a fair trial. As a result, the magistrates forced the possibility of being removed from office and having Philippi's privileges as a Roman colony revoked. And so they wrestled. And in verse 39 it says, Then they came, and they pleaded with them, they brought them out, and they asked them to depart from the city. Paul says, No, I'm not going to walk out. You go get them. Because if they come to me, it's going to be the same as if they apologize publicly. And the people are going to know that we didn't end up doing any wrong. And now with all that political pressure on them, they do go to them. And they're struggling through, through all of this. They asked them to depart from the city. Well, as Christians, they had been beaten publicly and declared criminals. The public would think that since they were criminals... The church that they planted were criminals also, and the new believers would be under immense persecution from those individuals. And so Paul made them come. Verse 39, and they came, and they pleaded with them, and they brought them out, and they asked them to depart from the city. Paul did this in order to protect the young believers in Philippi. Verse 40, so now they're released. The, the apology has been done. So they went out of the prison, and they entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them, and they departed. You notice what happens here? As soon as they're released, what do they do? Immediately they go to Lydia's house. Why do they go to Lydia's house? Not only is that where they're staying, but that's also where the church met. And before they had to leave Philippi, they wanted to make sure that that young church was encouraged. And, and that that young church knew that now they didn't have reason to worry because they had been vindicated by what had happened with the magistrates. And they went there and they encouraged them. And even today within the church, encouragement is so important, isn't it? I mean, we look at us, I, I could go around this, the sanctuary today, and many of us are going through challenges in our life. Sometimes they feel overwhelming. It's so nice to have a brother and, or a sister in Christ that's there to encourage us, to pray with us, to help us through these, these difficult times. And that's exactly what Paul did. He would always go back to the churches to, that he had planted in order to encourage them. Well, the title of today's message was The Prison Doors, uh, excuse me, And the Prison Doors Swung Open. And what I wanted you to see is that the jailer's story is really our story. Because before coming to Christ, we think we got the tiger by the tail. We think everything is going like that anaconda head. <laughs> we think everything is going fine. Everything's going fine in our, our, our lives. But maybe we're here today and we're struggling with drug addiction and nobody knows about it. We just, we, we just can't get through that drug addiction. Or maybe we're here today and we're struggling with alcoholism. Nobody knows that secret. We, we, we just can't, can't get over it. We get a little sip and we're, we're off on a tangent. We, we, we can't stop that. Or maybe we're sitting here today and we're struggling with pornography. You say, why in a church would you talk about struggling with pornography? Because statistics show that 70% of male men struggle with pornography. 30% of females struggle with pornography. You think, oh, they're, they're, they're getting it? No, it's different mainly for the females. The females tend to go into the romance novels and do it that way. There's struggles that are going on, and everybody goes through different struggles in their life. But what the Philippian jailer, I think, didn't realize is that the big struggle that he was going through is that he was a prisoner. He was in bondage to sin and to death. And there's only one way to get through that, and that is by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ. And that's as we put our trust in the Lord. Um, maybe there's somebody here today that's come in here, and you're at a point in your life where you feel like you're behind those bars, and, and you can't get out. Well, I'll tell you what, maybe you're like the Philippian jailer who was sleeping and, and just even though the, the, the songs were being sung and the prayers were being prayed was totally unconscious. But today you know you need Jesus. Let's go ahead and close in prayer today. And Lord, I thank you so much for everyone that's here. I thank you for your word. Lord, I praise you that your word is a manual for our lives. And as we go through the story today with the Philippian jailer who thought he had it all together with the, the great job and, and everything that he needed, comfortable enough that he slept on the job. 
Lord, in the end, he found out that he needed Jesus. And maybe there's someone here with a struggle in their life that needs to come to you. They need that, that Jesus moment, Lord, as they come to you in faith. And if that's the case, I, I pray they would pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Lord, my life has been a mess. I've done so many wrong things, and I've sinned against you, and I ask you for forgiveness. Lord, I repent of my sin. I change direction, and I ask that you come into my heart and life and help me to be the kind of man, woman, boy, or girl that you desire for me to be. Lord, this day, I repent. I change direction, and I surrender myself to you. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Lead me to the